Welcome to Hope is Here. My name is Greg Horn. We are hanging out again with Greg Williams. He is an author of a wonderful book called The Authority of Love. He's also a speaker. If you're looking for somebody for a conference, uh, a men's retreat, uh, to preach on a Sunday morning or do workshops, highly, highly recommend him. Uh, we've talked about discipleship uh, the previous two days. If you missed those two programs, really would encourage you to go to our website, Hope is here dot today and listen to those 14 minute programs. But today we're going to talk about a topic that you don't hear a lot about. It kind of makes people uncomfortable, but it's in the Bible and it's something that I know a lot of people struggle with and especially us men. And it's the topic of lust. And Greg, in your book, uh, you do a great job of tying in obviously the Bible, but also uh, from, from a movie. So share a little bit about that with us. Yeah, uh, it, I call it in there. It's the, the subtitle or the subheading in the book is called Self and Lust. Lust. And they go hand in self and anything and sin goes hand in hand, right? So self and lust, and I basically have a, a modern day biblical story movie mashup. I think it's what I call it, something like that. Uh, and what I do is I take uh, the the character of Caleb in the fireproof movie. I thought they did a, you know, the move, the acting was good, but the content was fabulous. They just nailed it. And, and everybody that sees it and really pays attention to it gets that. Well, if you remember, and if you don't, I I highly recommend it. Caleb, uh, played by Kirk Cameron from Growing Pains, is the fire chief. And he's got an issue in his life, and it's lust and pornography, or pornea, as I say in my book, which goes deeper than just pornography. And I I was sharing this with uh, addiction facilities and prisons for a while. And one of the things I would ask them, it, it caught my attention one time, did anybody notice what Caleb was looking at on his computer when the porn ad popped up? And nobody got it for a while. And then all of a sudden, some of them that had seen the movie started going, I was looking at boats. Well, it, having a boat is not a sin. Uh, having a boat as an idol is a sin. And, and they make it very clear in the movie that Caleb's boat was his idol. Matter of fact, he was withholding money from his wife and from her mother and the things he could have helped with. And That all changes to some degree. You'll have to watch it to get the story. I don't want to spoil it. But he's sitting on his computer by himself one day, and he's looking at these pictures of the boat. You can see he's just in seventh heaven. He's just like, wow, can't wait to get my boat. Life is going to be good when I get my boat. It's going to fulfill me. And then ding, up pops this ad. Want to see? We've all seen those things before, and we have a choice right there. But it was so interesting because he was working through the love dare, which they came up and in the uh, in the movie and he goes over and sits down he starts talking and he hears the voice of his father who had given him the book sort of narrating as he reads and he says parasites if you want to have a good marriage you got to recognize and remove and i'm not quoting it exactly the parasites in your life that if you don't and they can be drugs alcohol gambling por- pornography any of those if you don't they will ultimately destroy you your marriage and everyone around you you must get rid of him. He gets up, takes the computer monitor, jerks it out of the wall, and goes outside on a barrel, takes a baseball bat, and hammers it. And everybody goes, well, that's kind of harsh. And I go, no, it's not harsh. That's exactly what they're trying to say, is that when we get caught up in our own self-absorption, the enemy knows we're ripe to be drawn into sin. So he sends the temptations. He has some power to do those kind of things. And it's amazing how often when I am caught up in woe is me or look what a great job I've done or why didn't somebody notice it? It can be any variety of of thoughts about self-absorption. It's almost always then that the enemy comes in with an opportunity. Temptation, we call it. And that's what I saw in that. So, gee, I know there's another part to this. I want to Give you a chance to interject there if something on your mind with that. Well, I just think one of the things it costs us to get that a lot of times is fatigue. Mm-hmm. You know, when Absolutely. We get, get worn out and, you know, it can be from good things or it can be from things, you know, overworking and running all the kids' activities. I know spring starting with spring sports yep. and uh, people trying to go to the lake and all that and all that. But I have found at least when I give in to temptation and struggle with lust in my any area of my life, it's because of fatigue. Yep. And so I just think if somebody's listening today, uh, man, maybe you need to take a look at your schedule and your calendar and see where your priorities are, right? That's true. And I've got four or five. F's, if you can call them that. Fatigue is one of them. Famished, fearful, frustrated or angry, and fame. Mm -hmm. Those are typical spots. And guess what? In every one of those, something has caused me to, to 
look in and dwell, not in a good way, but to go, woe is me, or I can't believe they didn't notice, or look how great I am, or any or all the above. And we've convinced ourselves that we deserve whatever comes next. Oh, I'm hurting, so it's okay for me to follow through on that lust. Or, man, I'm such a great guy. So obviously I deserve this. There's, there's all kinds of things that we can do. There are five F's there I, I talked about. I don't have those in the book, but I've talked about those before and other times. So then I got to thinking, what's the, one of the greatest stories of lust in Scripture? And it's King David and Bathsheba. And it's so interesting, the parallels when you stop and think about it. King David, it says in 2 Samuel 11, one, or is it 1 Samuel? I think it's 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel yeah, 11, yeah, yeah. 11. 11. Yeah, 2 Samuel 11. Sorry about that. But it's 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. It says, in the spring, you just alluded to spring and all things going, when kings go off to war. Well, the Holy Spirit's telling us right there that a good king goes to war with his troops. David decided he didn't need to do that. They had just about defeated, I think it was the Amalekites at that time, but they had some sin in the camp. And so David goes, I'll just let Joab and my army go take care and clean that up for me, and I'll just chill. I'll just hang out in my palace and enjoy my kingdom and look at my boat. If we're talking about Caleb, right? I'm just going to dwell on David for a little while, and it's okay. God's given me this kingdom, and it's a, in and of itself, that is okay. But he already told us that what good kings do is go to war with their men. And David decided, I think I'll just chill. So he's chilling. There's nothing in the scripture that say David had any idea or thought of, I hope I find a naked woman bathing on a rooftop. We don't. But what was going on? David was self-absorbed. I don't need to be in the war. They can take care of that. And I can really enjoy my castle, my palace, and my kingdom. It's all about me. So what does the enemy do? David's really thinking a lot about himself these days. Okay, I think I'll, I'll, I'll orchestrate it as best I can. And we know he can do things. He's a prince of this air, so he can do some things that we can't in and of ourselves. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. But all of a sudden, he's out one night admiring his kingdom. And he looks over, and there's a beautiful naked woman bathing. And instead of going to the love dare, <laughs> which Caleb did in the movie, David decides, tell me, go find out who that woman is. He tells his servant. Now, I say one other thing in the book. Isn't it interesting that as long as David's thinking about himself and now lusting after this woman, because that's what it led to very easily, I can imagine, this is not scriptural, but I, human nature, that David, when he sends the servant, is thinking, I think my, my, my little servant, Jacoby here, is going to come back. That's not his name in scripture. I just made that up. But he's going to come back and tell me, hey, king, she's single. You can have her. That's just self-centered thinking, right? He already has shown us that he's thinking about himself. He's already shown us he'll give in to the lust. Go find out who she is. I want to know. So it's not a far step to go, I'm pretty sure he's going to come back with a favorable story. That's what we do. Famished or fame or fatigued or frustrated, any of those, we begin to create stories in our own flesh and in the culture and the world around us that fit what we want. And David go, he's going to come back and tell me she's single and she's mine. Doesn't happen. He comes back and says, oh, not only is she married, she's married to one of your 30 best men, Uriah the Hittite. Well, now David's got a conflict. Now what's he going to do? He's been self-absorbed. He's now been tempted. He's now probably crafted a story in his mind that fits his temptation and his lust. And now he's got to make a choice. And since he's already gone down that path, what choice does he make? We know the story. He doesn't smash the computer like Caleb did. He chooses bring her to me, has sex, gets her pregnant, and then says, uh, uh-oh, found out she's pregnant. Nathan comes to him and says, David, rich man had a thousand lambs. Neighbor had one. Time for sacrifice or a feast comes. The rich man says, I don't want to sacrifice any of mine. I'll take the one. David said, that man must die. When I've shared this story in messages and churches and stuff, I'll ask people, tell me, did David recognize the sin? And most people go, no. I go, then why did he say that man must die? Now let me ask you a deeper question because this is what sin does to us. Did re David recognize the sin, that sin in his own life? Ah, that's the no answer. No, he didn't. He was blinded to it. He recognized as soon as Nathan described the sin, but he couldn't see it in his own life because he'd already blinded himself. Self-absorption, temptation, lust, sin, shot. <laughs> now, God's gracious. 
He was good. We find out that Bathsheba's second son, the first one died. Bathsheba's second son was Solomon, who reigned in place of David. So there's grace. It's a great story, but it ought to tell us something about how we can get so easily caught up in that. Well, and I think the thing to for somebody listening today is what is it that you know that you're on that line that you're being tempted? Yes, and, please. You know, rather doing what Caleb did in the movie and destroying his computer yeah. or whatever, uh, you know, don't do what David did and, you know, stop whatever that temptation it is, you know, whether yeah. it could be a gambling addiction or, right. you know, alcohol, you're struggling yeah. with that. Just the first thing to keep a temptation or if you've already crossed that line, is to come clean about yeah. and get healing. Yeah. And yet, uh, boy, if you're hopefully you can get on the front side of that before the temptation. Well, and you said gambling, and there, it could be anything. It could be, a, it could be drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever, as, as, as they listed in the Love Dare and it's in Scripture. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Oswald Chambers of My Utmost for His Highest says this, we tend to think of lust as sex only because that's the way we've, we've described it and, and seen it lived out. But he said, lust is really, the sin of lust is really described as this. I want what I want and I want it now. That could be gambling. It could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be money. It could be sex. It could be another woman. It could be covetousness. And lust covers a lot of things, but it really is about deifying self. And that's why when we're self-absorbed, and there are moments we need to be introspective and thinking about ourselves. We've got to love ourselves before we can truly love others, but only if we love God first. And there's time for that. But when we dwell on that, we can see how easily we can be pulled in. Caleb almost was in the movie, but he showed the strength to die to self and choose to live for the Lord. David was a man after God's own heart, but in that moment he was weak. And instead of dying to self, he said, self gets what self wants. Bring her to me. And so that's what we've got to understand. That's why the whole discipleship thing of dying to self is what makes us the disciples because we can't have him as Lord and live for ourselves. It just won't work. Jesus, made, There is no straddling the fence. We talk about it like it's okay if you're, there's maturation, but you can't willingly have one foot in the world and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He says you have to die to that. Deny yourself. And that's something I think we need to teach more of with the grace that you talked about, that he helps us do that, strength to do it, and the grace and forgiveness when we stumble. Well, fortunately, we are almost out of time. Greg, we got about 45 seconds. Tell them about the book. I know you've got a workbook that you're working on. Yeah, we're working on a workbook. We've actually got a, a couple of ministries, one in particular that is using this for their discipleship because it's so full of Scripture and drives them back to that. But it is the authority of love. Just think about that title for a little while. It's intriguing and provocative. The Authority of Love, the second edition. You can find it on Amazon. And, uh, and if you buy it and would like, and you like it, and even if you don't, give me a review. I'm a big boy. I can handle it, okay? But we thank you for that. And uh, if we can help you in any way, as Greg said earlier, a conference, a retreat, or a series, if you're locally, we'd love to share with you if, as the Lord leads. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief. Well, I know you'll be really blessed by it. It's a great book. If you want to grow in your relationship, you want to take with Jesus and say, you know, I really want to grow and mature as a follower of Jesus, this will definitely take you to the next level. I think about John the Baptist and Jesus when uh, they said, who do we follow, you or him? And John the Baptist, you know, said, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. And um, that's I want to leave that thought as we go into the weekend today that maybe that would be the desire of your heart mm. that you would say, Jesus, you must increase and I must decrease. We're out of time, but I'm glad you joined us. If you're blessed by this program, share it with somebody else. Go to our website, hopeishere.today. That's hopeishere.today. For Greg Williams, I'm Greg Horn. We'll see you next week on Hope Is Here.